Um, well, I think we'll get started and get the introductions going and have plenty of time for our guest speaker to have a presentation and open it up for questions. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Good morning. I'm Vasiliki Anist, I'm the business director of the Brown Center for Cancer Drug Development and also the chief innovation officer at Norris. And I am a very excited um, to have you join us today. I'll have um, Emily share the screen and I'll give you just a couple um, um, pieces of information as for background on the Brown Center. Let's see, are those slides up? <laughs> Emily, can you share screen please? Yes, it should be up. Okay, great. Sorry, I didn't see that. All right, wonderful. Okay, so um, we're really um, proud of the work being done at Norris um, with a generous gift from the Rosalind Harold Ray Brown Foundation. We were able to launch the Center for Cancer Drug Development with a mission to accelerate promising oncology therapeutics into the clinic through collaborative drug development. There's a lot more information on our website. Next slide, please. There's a lot more information on our website, but I wanted to give an overview of the scope um, at, at the CCDD. We are open to all therapeutic modalities, so very agnostic in that respect. Um, in terms of the stage, it's also very broad from target validation up to preclinical stage. There could be some exceptions based on um, the context of the project. The therapeutic areas are oncology needs and USC Norris catchment um, area priorities may be um, prioritized. Um, in terms of eligibility, it, are, it does pertain to individuals with a track record of conducting cancer research. Um, Norris members, again, may be prioritized, but that's not um, a requirement. The project lead, though, must be USC faculty and have the obligation to assign um, intellectual property to USC. You know, this is not a hard no. If there's some um, unique situations, we do um, um, encourage you to talk to us and please reach out to me. Everything is a conversation and in context. So, um, but we do have some guidelines here in terms of our scope. Next up. In terms of our process, it's a very unique process. We've developed a systematic process that blends academic and industry, scientific and business considerations. So we can identify and prioritize potential um, oncology therapeutic targets. You know, it is um, strongly supported by the MeSH Business Development and Industry Relations team. And they work um, by proactively um, outreaching to faculty and collaborate with you on the intake submission to create a narrative that would, if, if selected, would get presented to um, an external advisory committee of experts in the pharmaceutical and venture capital arena. That external committee will prioritize the projects a couple times a year and present those to the CCDD leadership team for um, prioritization and um, decisions to award for funding. Um, what's unique about this process is this is not a, a, an RFA approach. You will work with MeSH to um, work on your, on your narrative and your intake submission. And if awarded, you also collaborate with CCDD and MeSH to co-create your project um, scope of work. And so this is um, meant to be very iterative and collaborative as drug development does require a team sport with multidisciplines and different degrees of expertise. Next. So that's what's equally important in drug development is knowing um, the different stages and time points that may be available for partnering. And partnering doesn't only mean at the time that it needs to be exiting the university. Actually, more importantly, it's even prior to that. So we've taken an approach to provide a menu of options for our faculty throughout the process. Shown here is one of our lead um, partners, Sanford Berman Prebis in San Diego, that is our primary partner for small molecule and high throughput screening projects. Um, but there are other um, areas um, of, of uh, partnership that are available that we're looking to fill um, in other modalities as well. Um, but what's really critical here for questions that you have um, with uh, this um, alliance is to please contact Melissa Rogers. She's also on this um, seminar here from the 
MESH team. The Sanford Burnham Prebis arrangement with um, the CCDD is not only um, related to oncology, so it's just to note that that is an umbrella agreement that could be related to other projects. However, for projects related to oncology and that run through the CCDD, um, that will um, be strictly um, following the process and that I just outlined and the decisions made by um, Dr. Lerman at the Cancer Center. Next, please. All right, I'm very happy to um, present um, Dr. Delisha Patel, the Senior Associate Director of Research Affairs um, at the USC Mann School of, of, I think we just re redid the name here. So Delisha, I think you're gonna have that on your first slide. The Mann School, which was very exciting, that was recently um, endowed. Um, Dr. Patel has a PhD in immunology and infectious diseases from Montana State University. She studies sensory and regular systems um, of clinical relevance for strains in bacteria and other um, host innate immune systems. But prior to joining USC, she served as the founding director of research and assistant professor for occupational therapy doctorate program in Montana, where she's built various some sustainable educational and research programs. At the School of Pharmacy here, her responsibilities are broad. They include various aspects of research development from educational programs, research opportunities, expansion of core facilities and performance analytics. Today, she's going to be telling us about the launch of their drug discovery and development capabilities and additional capabilities they have there. And we're very excited to have you here, Delisha. Um, I will, before she gets started, I will encourage you all at the end of her presentation, please um, feel free to turn your cameras on. Although we're virtual and it's, this is a Zoom meeting, we really want this interactive. Feel free to ask questions, either raise your hand or directly um, reach out through the chat. We definitely want this to be a conversation and learn more from Delisha today. Thank you, Delisha, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And I'm hoping that you guys can see my screen here. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, and like um, was said in the introduction, uh, the School of Pharmacy was just recently named because of a heavy endowment. And we're now known as the USC Alfred Human um, School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And I'm here uh, with a lot of excitement to share our drug discovery and development capabilities that we have here at the School of Pharmacy that is open to um, the vast research infrastructure and researchers across USC and also uh, external partners that we may have. Um, so I, I have my contact information over here and at the end of two, uh, but uh, after we're done with the talk, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you might have and also schedule a follow-up call that might be needed to have a further um, uh, elaborative discussion on the same. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen a, a version of this drug discovery and development process in one form or another, but essentially, as we all know, uh, drug discovery and development starts off with the basic science research that sort of uh, helps with the target selection. You know, a lot of molecular bi biology assays, cell based studies, and in vivo studies compromise to sort of selecting a particular target that could ultimately be then go on to the screening and lead discovery phase where there is a lot of high throughput screening, assay development, some sort of pharmacologic profiling, understanding of physiochemical properties, and then also a medicinal chemistry component that sort of leads to the synthesis or sort of changing the modalities to ultimately the lead optimization so that we have a candidate that is has the potency, the selectivity, and the metabolic stability and the hypothesized stability to sort of be a target molecule or candidate for actual therapeutic use. Um, the development process also involves in vivo safety and efficacy. And what I'm gonna show, uh, share today is how throughout each of these processes, the School of Pharmacy has resources um, in terms of faculty expertise or core facilities um, to help you at each stage of your drug discovery and development process with research infrastructure, personnel, subject matter expertise, um, and also sort of this liaison capability where a project can go from start to finish with a liaison sort of handling each stage of the process along with the faculty investigator working on the same. Um, I do remember that a few um, seminars ago that um, the CCDD had offered 
there was a discussion of what are some barriers to academic drug discovery. Um, and sort of this cartoon analogy that was published in Nature gives a very good understanding of how this train, which is sort of the drug discovery and development research train or investigators working on the same, go through the track and the, and the different processes that was outlined in the slide previous to this. And they come across all the different good points, sort of the next step to success that are descri described in the blue dots over here. And then there are some roadblocks too, by described by these red hexagons here. So um, if I were to point at this first red hexagon here, you know, during the screening, the actual target identification step, some of the road uh, roadblocks that one could hit is either there is interference with the assays, uh, the compound does not perform to uh, uh, the, the needed assay results. Um, there is no biological rationale um, that meets the actual target. And most importantly, there is no financial support to continue um, moving forward. And then that stops um, the, the drug discovery process. The other roadblock that um, academic researchers sort of face is the lead biologist leaves, you know, the university second. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, there is lack of collaborative spirit. You know, drug discovery and development process is a very heavy interdisciplinary process that requires subject matter experts from various different fields to come together to put their brains um, together into each of these different processes to actually have a candidate for therapeutic degrees. Um, you know, the other roadblock is uh, a flat um, surface um, activity relationship compound that is not optimizable. A lot of academic entities do not have the medicinal chemistry support needed, which means that they have to outsource their work to other um, organizations, whether that be small biotech companies or CROs, that again, requires a lot of financial support. And that is a challenge in academic research settings. Um, and then there are also unresolved admin qualities um, that, that could come as a roadblock too. And so if I were to summarize all the different roadblocks into four broad categories, it's one, challenge is conceptualizing the opportunity that a candidate or a target selected can go through the entire process of the drug discovery development realm, the expertise needed as far as personnel expertise needed, the actual execution of the process, because as we all know, it's years and years worth of research and work to go from start to finish. And it requires a multidisciplinary team to come together to solve these complex problems. And then the fourth major criteria being funding. Um, as the lack of um, resources or funding available to conduct these processes. So what is the solution to these problems? Um, and one answer is core facilities. They are an integral part for breakthrough research. And um, as suggested in the report here, core facilities essentially enable scientists to design their studies using multiple technologies, you know, different infrastructures with different modalities and capabilities that would otherwise be not be present in an investigator's lab because of lack of funding to support and maintain these heavy infrastructure and expensive infrastructure, and also the personnel required to maintain the same. Um, so essentially, if I were to put it in a nutshell, core facilities um, essentially provide investigators the advantage where they do not have to purchase the heavy uh, expensive equipment and maintain it and also comes with the technology experts um, with the same. Um, if there are two different kinds of core facility models, working models, um, one being uh, the user laboratories where you essentially have the equipment available, you have resources staff that provide you with the training to the researchers that can come in, use the equipment, think of it as a rental, and then ultimately generate results that can then lead you on to the next step. There is also an all-inclusive service model where you have equipment available, uh, you have the technology experts who are not only subject matter experts on the equipment of use, but also understand the science and the research in collaboration with the investigator to generate results that advance um, uh, your research as well. There is uh, ultimately either of these two models can generate into standard workflow 
you have the capability to develop new technologies and methods or applications. And also you could have a training environment because we're in academia where students, postdocs, and other trainees can come and train on the state-of-the-art equipment um, and sort of enhance their research to the next step. Obviously, uh, we're talking core facilities and that comes with a lot of dollar value and also the personnel needed associated with it. And this cartoon sort of does a very good job sort of establishing what are the four pillars to have a sustainable core facility. Um, one, you need the space and the infrastructure uh, to sort of build um, and maintain these expensive uh, equipment. You obviously need the personnel, which is an integral part to maintaining the sport facility that are talented and has a subject matter expertise to sort of help you in a collaborative spirit to advance your research. And you need an evaluation that constantly evaluating the needs to sort of add in new improved new facilities, new infrastructure as needed with time. And then that all is sustainable only with the investment. Um, we are very thankful to a very visionary leader, our Dean, uh, Dr. Vasilius Papadopoulos um, from the School of Pharmacy, who has generously um, uh, understands the importance of the core facilities and research infrastructure to enhance uh, research activities. Um, and the Office of Research, too, uh, with their core instrumentation program, uh, help us facilitate this entire process of acquiring, maintaining equipment, um, and, and then sort of evaluating and then adding on to new infrastructure as need be. So moving forward, I would like to give you guys an overview of what the core facilities um, capabilities are at the School of Pharmacy. For those of you who have not been um, to our building, uh, all of our three core facilities that are listed here, our Translational Research Lab Core, our Histology Core, um, our Multi-Mix Mass Spectrometry Core, and our Medicinal Chemistry Core are all located in the Pharmaceutical Sciences Center, PSC, on the Health Sciences campus across this building. Um, what I'm going to do for the other half of my talk is briefly go over the capabilities of each of these core facilities and how these sort of support that drug discovery and development figure that we saw earlier in my introduction um, and how um, each, each core benefits that entire process. Um, first, I would like to give you an overview of our Translational Research Lab core. It has... Um, more than 80 different equipment from basic sample processing, uh, automated sample processing to high-end imaging, in vivo imaging capabilities, and flow cytometers. Um, so just to give you an overview, some of our sample processing equipment include automated pipettes, automated purification system, and tissueizers, sort of helpful in that high throughput assay development process and the drug screening or target selection process. Um, um, that's helpful there too. We have equipment that support molecular biology and analysis needs too, that range from spectral photometers, plate readers, um, PCR capabilities, real-time PCR capabilities, color metric and fluorometry capabilities as well, to sort of understand that molecular characterization, if you have a small molecule, protein, or drugs, or metabolites of interest, that could be potential targets um, for therapeutic cues. We also have equipment that support DNA RNA sequencing capabilities, uh, where there are automated chip based electrophoresis uh, equipment. We have single cell analysis, Rapsodi. We also have the MySeq next gen sequencing capabilities that are available as well. Um, we have equipment in the category of cell in, in and immunobiology, where you can do uh, multiplex assays using our plate readers. There is a capability to um, understand metabolism and ex vivo analysis using our CFARS analyzers that we have. We can also do single cell studies using flow cytometers. Now, I do know um, that next moving on uh, for imaging purposes, we have a citation 5 microplate microscopy to sort of understand that single cell uh, imaging capabilities. We have an IVIS small animal imager too, and then we have fluorescent and confocal microscopes. I do understand that a lot of these capabilities are available across all the different cores across USC, some being at Keck, some being at UPC. Uh, but what's unique about the Translational Research Lab is one, it's an end user lab where essentially researchers come and get trained and can use the equipment 
along with expertise from our core staff. And then two is that it could be because of the boutique of different equipment that we have to offer, it is sort of like your pilot stop. And so you're just trying to understand the asset development capabilities, and you just don't know how this is going to do. Running them on these boutique of equipment that we have can sort of then get you to the next step where you can use a specialized core, like a flow cytometry core that's available at Tech or an imaging core to sort of go on to the next level and then develop your assays further. Um, and that's that's what we is our mission with our translational research lab core. Uh, it supports, um, I mean, the TR lab has been functional for over five years now, and it has well supported over 100 labs across USC. And we have uh, external um, small biotech companies and pharmaceuticals that come in um, to, to use the capabilities that we have to offer the Translational Research Lab. Some of our users are uh, people from the Keck School of Medicine, uh, the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center too. Uh, some external um, clients include Matza Foods and Gen Vivo as well um, to come in and they, they use our equipment and, and get their results uh, going on from there. So the next question is, how does TR Lab help with this entire sphere of drug discovery and development process. So like I said, with our boutique capabilities, um, you know, TRLAC can help in the target selection process where you, uh, one can do molecular biologies, cell-based studies or in vivo studies. Um, and there is some level of pharmacokinetic profiling too. During the drug development process, the in vivo safety and efficacy um, can be conducted at the TR lab too, if you have small animals that you would like to do um, in conjunction with the TR lab. So sort of to give you an understanding of how TR lab works it, into that different model of core facility use that we have, this is a user laboratory. We have the equipment, we have expert staff that would provide the researchers with the training. People can come in, get trained, use our equipment and generate their results to move on to their next step in this entire drug discovery and um, development reel. Our other core that we have to offer is our multi-omics mass spectrometry core. Um, I do have to say that this core was set up uh, right when the pandemic started. It was set up in March of 2020. And um, I have to give uh, credit to the core staff for doing a phenomenal job of, of setting up the core and um, sort of bringing in new state-of-the-art modalities to take our capabilities to the next level. You know, the, the ultimate goal of the mass spectrometry board is to provide consultation um, and support to researchers across USC um, and with the state-of-the-art um, mass spectrometry method methodologies and technologies that we have available. Uh, so some of the equipment that are um, included in our mass spectrometry core include the thermal Fisher Q exacto Orbi trap. So for those of you who who do not know what mass spectrometry is, it is essentially uh, provides you with a mass to charge ratio to characterize the actual um, um, molecular weight um, and characterize the protein or small molecule of interest. So what the Orbi trap can do for us is essentially it could do uh, a mass spec analysis of intact proteins. It could help with protein ident identification. Let's say you have a candidate that sort of helps with post-translational modifications that could be phosphorylation, blood phosphorylation, whatever. We have capabilities with our equipment and core staff to, to study that too. We can do a lot of targeted works, including targeted proteomics and understand site-specific modifications especially if you have a cross-linker and you wanted to know where exactly it is finding. Um, the other equipment that we have is the SIAX, uh, QTAP 6500 and 5502, that sort of help with, um, uh, they're triple quad mass spectrometers and they're very sensitive LC system associated with it. It's just a perfect match for quantitative and qualitative metabolomics if you may, an untargeted work and other analysis and biological samples, including serum, blood, um, cell cultures, um, tissues. Um, so very good for metabolomics work as well. Um, just to throw out there, uh, in conjunction with the TR lab, something that the mass spec core has is a multi drop combi dispensing system. Uh, it is a great equipment for high throughput dispensing of solutions in a microplate, if you may. So it can dispense up to eight different kinds of solutions. So let's say if you have 
high throughput screening that you would like to do. This could be like your sample prep stock find um, using uh, our multi-drug combi and it ge generates the plate within a matter of seconds. Um, it's sort of like a robot. The very unique part of our multi-mix mass spectrometry core is our multi-imaging capabilities. It is uh, essentially a state-of-the-art Rabiflex tissue typer. Um, this equipment is nine feet tall um, and essentially, this right here is capable of doing label-free imaging at the pixel size um, resolution uh, to sort of resolve um, spatially um, localization of biological macromolecules across tissue sections. So basically, if I were to summarize it, it is, it is unique to USC. Uh, our, our core is the only one that has the multi-imaging capabilities. Um, and it can do high throughput protein identification and drug screening at a very high spatial resolution without having to label your target. It's label-free imaging. And what we can do is combine this with our histology core to sort of do a region of interest analysis with a detailed annotation and identification of cancer biomarkers or other disease biomarkers, if there are any. So to give you... Um, just an overview of what our histology core and our malady imaging can do together. Our histology core has tissue processors, H&E standards, and cryostat that can sort of help with the sectioning um, and H&E uh, histology staining to sort of understand the region of analysis. You take that and you can then take the very next section for malady imaging and sort of do a region of, region of interest analysis to understand where exactly your drug candidate has been metabolized on the tissue of interest. Um, this sort of is an example of a um, distribution of lipids in a mouse brain. So this particular red um, mouse brain section is a particular um, M to Z ratio, which um, M to Z um, peak, which represents a, a biomarker. And this is another biomarker in the same tissue. And if we were to do an overlay, we can exactly tell how each of the biomarkers are spatially distributed in that particular area of the brain. You combine this with histology capabilities, you can now know where exactly your region of interest is and how your drug is metabolized in the particular tissue section. Um, as here is a list of some of the people um, that are working with our multi-mix mass spectrometry core and the different kinds of projects um, that that we support, uh, including protein imaging, you know, for different tissues, lungs, kidneys, brains, um, profiling of um, to, uh, small diseases in, 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 in testes as well, um, my skin. And then we've also done some protein molecular wave determination and post-translational modification analysis uh, and nucleotide analysis too, using uh, our other mass spectrometers that, are, that we have in hand. So how does uh, the multiomics mass spectrometry core um, help with the drug discovery uh, and development real again? You know, again, it can help with your target selection where um, in vivo studies, molecular biology and cell-based studies can be supported. During the assay development and physiochemical property analysis, the mass spectrometry can come in for molecular weight determination, pharmacokinetic profiling if there is, and the lead optimization step as well. Um, our mass spectrometry core is an all-inclusive service. We have um, te technology experts or expert staff that have subject matter experts in all the different fields that we have mentioned above in our capabilities. We also have high-end equipment and that will provide you with results that are needed um, for the next step of your research, whether that be publication or going on um, further. We have recently established our medicinal chemistry core um, as of June of 2022. Uh, and we're very pleased because it's, um, from my understanding, it's the only medicinal chemistry support that USC has um, on campus. And um, I, I feel there is so much potential that can be done um, with, with our medicinal chemistry core. Um, we offer services in terms of target validation, drug design, hit to lead chemistry. We can also do scale up synthesis and purification for compounds that you already might have. Um, and might be paying um, another company a lot more money. We can do it at um, a, a reasonable price for you. 
We also help with um, synthesis of small molecules, intermediates if you may have any, any metabolites. Uh, we can also help the pet chemistry by sort of doing the uh, radio labeling as necessary for pet chemistry, very important in cancer drug delivery. We also help with structural determination in conjunction with our NMR capabilities and our mass spec capabilities. And we have personnel that sort of help uh, on the consultation of ADME in vivo PKPD studies along with our faculty expertise in that area. Um, from, uh, from my conversation with Dr. Sayed Ahmad, who's sort of the associate director um, of the core, um, he's, he came in to an empty lab in June of 2022. And in a matter of four months, he set up the lab and already has projects going. So he, there is capability uh, with our core staff to deliver results uh, in a timely manner. Uh, we have equipment that include, I know this is very intriguing to me, a biotouch microwave system. From what I understand, this is essentially, rather than having to spend hours and hours monitoring a chemical reaction, this is just like a microwave would do. You put your reaction into the system and it generates results in a matter of time uh, and a few hours as opposed to an entire day. We also have a HBLC system. And we also have a rotor wafer sort of to help with the process of drug synthesis. Um, some of the ways our medicinal chemistry core um, helps with chemical modalities and uh, structure activity relationship is uh, we have personal support and technology support to help you with nucleoside synthesis. Um, as we all know, nucleoside transporters are valuable drug targets, um, especially for cancers. Uh, we can help with peptide synthesis too, uh, which is sort of an emergent um, target for tumor penetration and selectivities. Uh, Protax, um, as we all know, our proteolysis is targeting uh, chimera. They are um, small molecules which have a linker capability, uh, and our medicinal chemistry core can provide you expertise with Protax chemistry as well. Uh, we can help you with small molecule um, drug synthesis as well. And a very unique aspect is the pet chemistry that is um, very much valuable for cancer drug discovery and development. Um, uh, is available at our medicinal chemistry core, but the precursors required for pet um, pet chemistry can be synthesized um, with our medicinal chemistry core support. The other aspect of our core support is um, structure activity relationship studies. You know, let, let's say you have a drug like scaffold and you would like to understand its potency. How does it interact with the receptor drug? What are some modifications that might be needed in terms of bioavailability? Um, something to modulate metabolism, you know, whether to allow the, um, to reduce toxicity and selectivity. There is, cap our, mass, uh, our medicinal chemistry core has the support that is required to make all these changes that will enhance your structure activity relationship studies, thereby targeting a, a candidate to increase its selectivity and potency to make it a therapeutic for use in clinicals. One of the way that we do the lead optimization is by using uh, machine learning software, um, using that has the liability of, uh, liability of cytochrome P450 to sort of make the chemical modifications that is needed, whether that be addition or removal of hydrogen bonding, um, design of a product, um, conducting bioisotherism um, uh, modifications or disruption of crystal packaging to make sure that it, your, your therapeutic target becomes um, um, available for, for use uh, and change its formulations. These are some of the um, uh, collaborators that the Medicinal Chemistry Core has ongoing work with. Uh, it ranges from diseases like Alzheimer, cancer, uh, other um, uh, neuro neurological disorders. Uh, and then we also have um, um, people from the DOD side of the University of La Alabama um, that are interested using our Medicinal Chemistry Core. So, how does the medicinal chemistry core help with the drug design and development? Essentially everything, you know, from the target selection point of view to the actual assay development, consultation, um, in vivo safety and efficacy, potency, 
uh, physiological properties synthesis with the actual medicinal chemistry component and, and modifications that might be needed for the lead optimization process as well. Um, our medicinal chemistry core is an all-inclusive service, just like our mass spectrometry core. It has state-of-the-art equipment, uh, subject matter technology experts that sort of come together to, in a collaborative manner to help you through this entire process and then give you the results that are needed for the next step of your research. Um, what I would like to go on to is how during the drug discovery and development process, something wrong with the animation here. Um, we always talk about PKPD studies and we talk about ADNI properties. You know, we always want to get a better understanding of how um, um, the, the drug is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted. Those are an important aspect for pharmacological profiling of a drug candidate, and also to do quantitative pharmacodynamics. Uh, the School of Pharmacy uh, will be establishing a Center for Quantitative Drug and Disease Modeling, which will aim to improve population and individual health by transforming drug development through model-informed decisions um, and um, resources that are available for the same. Um, in, in addition, we have faculty expertise, too. Um, we have a lot of faculty in our clinical pharmacy and our um, uh, pharmacological and pharmaceutical sciences department that do extensively extensive work on the ADME studies and PKPD studies as well, that you can then collaborate with to sort of give you the lead optimization results. I want to now transition into the whole drug development aspect and, and how sort of that helps is one of the biggest challenges that we face um, as academic drug researchers or in general drug discovery researchers is in vivo safety and efficacy. As we all know, uh, majority of the drug candidates uh, fail at this stage of the drug discovery and development process because one, it's, it, it induces hepatocyte toxicity um, or it's it, the, the safety and efficacy is not well measured. You know, some of the ways in vivo safety and efficacy was studied, um, was using cell monolayers, there was 2D in vitro cultures that sort of offered a rapid and reproducible way to analyze drug responsibly, uh, responses, but they sort of lacked that 3D culture, the hydrogen matrix that was needed to um, recapitulate human pathology and physiology. Um, you know, 3D cell cultures and organites have been used since the 90s until about the 2010s that sort of had these organites that were highly variable in size and shape um, that sort of made it difficult to analyze it. In addition, the organoids um, were entrapped cells, so therefore they lacked the ability of the underlying pathology and the physiology that happens in the human cell environment where you have immune cells, you have endothelial cells, and you have all these different cell layers that are sort of coming together to produce that matrix. So now we have the organ on ship technology that has evolved pretty recently, um, that has evolved in vitro system, and it enables research to overcome these experimental challenges that are associated with 2D um, in vitro cell cultures and 3D organite structures where essentially you can now have a tissue or an organ on a chip that mimics the actual pathology of the human um, human pathology where you have the underlying cells, the immune cells and the endothelial cells along with your organ of interest that you can now test your drug, a drug candidate for in vivo safety and efficacy. You know, recently the FDA Modernization Act was passed um, to which essentially is in favor of the organ on chip technology and it's it's allowing manufacturers and sponsors of a drug to use alternative testing methods to animal testing as sort of to uh to investigate the safety and effectiveness of a drug or for its responses so brief overview of what organ chips are organ chips are nothing but microengineered environments uh, with living human cells that provide a window into human biology and disease um, they provide you with the mechanical forces that typically go on in a, in a human cell environment. 
it gives you the gas composition that is needed the stretch the pressure and also the fluidic shear along with the immune cells to study the actual response of a drug candidate um, there have been several organ on chips that have been developed including a brain chip a lung chip an intestine chip a kidney chip and a liver chip um, liver chip, obviously an important tool for the drug discovery and development capabilities, along with our brain chip for, for the CNS cytotoxicity um, aspect. So recently, Emulate is a company that has, um, 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 that provides with these organ on chip technologies, recently published uh, an article, in fact, it just came out pretty recent, um, on in nature that sort of does a performance assessment and the economic analysis of their human liver chip for predictive toxicology studies. As we all know, drug-induced liver injury, it, it accounts for about 13% of clinical trial figures. Um, you know, I mean, you go through all that process of drug discovery and development to, like I said, realize that, um, that it doesn't work. So organ on chip essentially recapitulates the organ level pathophysiology uh, and it has been approved by the Innovation and Quality Consortium as a qualifying preclinical model to study in vivo safety and efficacy. Um, and essentially, Emulate's liver chip uh, met the qualification of the IQ, and it provides known um, it provides guidelines for across 27 known hepatotoxic and non-toxic drugs with about 100% specificity, letting us know that these are essentially helpful in the lead optimization stage of the drug discovery process, and it limits the number of steps that are needed in terms of that lead optimization process. Because this is such a new technology, I figured I'll, I'll share with you a, a video from, um, from the company Emulate to sort of give an overview of what, what the organ on chip looks like, how can you modulate it, um, and, then, and then sort of give you an overview of that too. Our intestine chip allows us to recreate the healthy and diseased states of the small intestine and provides a real-time window into the inner workings of human biology. It contains two fluidic channels that are separated by a porous, stretchable membrane. The top side of the membrane is covered with human epithelial cells that form villi-like structures. The bottom side of the membrane is lined with human endothelial cells. This recreates the arrangement of cell layers that exist in the human small intestine. Nutrient-rich media flows through the top channel, while media that emulates blood flows through the bottom channel and applies shear stress to the cells. We can rhythmically stretch and relax the channels, recreating the mechanical forces cells experience during peristalsis. The intestine chip helps us predict how medicines, chemicals, and foods affect human health. It's one part of the human emulation system, which is allowing us to gain a deeper understanding of human biology. So this sort of gives you an overview and what we envision um, doing uh, with this um, organ on chip technology is we have submitted a core instrumentation grant through the USC Office of Research and along with our support from the Dean Papadopoulos to gain, uh, acquire this organ on chip technology at, at, as one of our core facility equipment and infrastructure to offer that can sort of help with the entire sphere of drug discovery and development from the basic um, sciences and candidate um, identification um, using in vivo models in substitute for animal models, these organ on chips can be used. And in addition, also for lead optimization studies and also for doing in vivo safety and efficacy studies, this could be a valuable tool for researchers to use for, for, for their um, uh, analysis. Um, so I just wanted to end uh, by sort of sharing, I mean, uh, I, this was shared in the introduction earlier as to how the different CCDD um, in the drug discovery and development process and how there is a partnering zone available 
through my talk, uh, I'm hopeful that I've conveyed to you that we can essentially partner with all the highlighted areas in this red box from basic research to in vivo um, 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 pharmacokinetic profiling and safety and efficacy studies too. In addition, the School of Pharmacy has a, a international regulatory um, science program that sort of is the center for regulatory science that helps with the regulation and policy equipment too. So we have capabilities to go from the basic science to all the way to clinical development and also with policy and regulatory science along with our faculty expertise and core facilities to provide you an entire field of drug discovery and development research. So quickly, how do you connect with us? Um, the research office website is over here. You can always contact me, our core staff who are subject matter experts in each of the different fields that, we've uh, that I've mentioned earlier. Dr. Jinji Watanabe is the Associate Director for the Translational Research Lab Core and the Histology Core. Dr. Nadia Dildar is uh, our Associate Director for the Multi-Analytics Mass Spectrometry Core. And Dr. Sayed Kulin Ahmed is uh, the Associate Director for the Medicinal Chemistry Core. Um, I would like to thank Dean Papadopoulos and Dr. Annie Wong Beringer, Associate Dean for Research, for their continuous support to acquire and maintain state of the art infrastructure. The core staff, without whom these equipment and the, this infrastructure means nothing because they are essentially providing the technological expertise needed. And also our research office staff, Joanne and Sharon, for their continuous support with the administrative work that goes on to maintaining um, these equipment. Uh, and with that, I would take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Delisha. That was fantastic. It is a very rich set of resources, and we're excited to have you um, present today. We'll open up for questions. We have the first one here from Dr. Lentz. You can unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice overview. I have a couple of um, comments and questions. Would like to know the capacity for high throughput screening, what you have done or what you're doing or what you offer. Um, I also would like to know a little bit more about your preclinical models. We have worked actually, we have grant funding on the emulate organ chip for colon cancer with Shaman Mumenthaler. So there are some lim limitations to the organ chip model. What other preclinical models do you have for um, um, drug development? So I think I'm starting with these two. Okay. Uh, for our high throughput screening, um, you know, we we have equipment which are automated pipetters and imagers, uh, and that as far as assay development consultation, our core staff can help you with that. Uh, we're still in the process of looking and looking. I mean, we're just starting to scratch our surface uh, in this entire film. So there is there is um, opportunities there. Um, as far as preclinical models, you know, I mean. This organ on chip is our first sort of endeavor to, to provide um, a, a place where you can either develop a model in conjunction with our core staff. Um, um, let's say you had a brain chip or a, col a colon or intestine chip that you would like to, uh, to study. In, in conjunction with our core staff, we can develop uh, that with, with you and, and your, your personnel there. And then if you have any animal models, you know, we have the capabilities to screen them too. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, thank you so okay. much. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> think, uh, Yali, you were next. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. It's really eye-opening actually. Uh, so I learned some of the really cool uh, uh, equipment you guys have, especially uh, this multi-imaging uh, mm -hmm. capability. So I'm just wondering if that's something that uh, can be used to detect uh, small molecule like protac efficacy in protein degradation or small molecule entrance into the cell. Is it something that this thing can do? Yes, yes, that is the unique capability of our multi imaging uh, that that can be done, and it's actually label free. So whether you have a cell based uh, a microplate or you have an actual tissue, our multi imaging is capable of doing that. Okay, so a related question. So is uh, such a sophisticated equipment, is that open for training for students and postdocs? No, uh, okay. like I said earlier in my talk, our multi-mix mass spectrometry core is sort of an all service inclusive where we have the equipment and the personnel to give you the results directly in hand. We work closely 
with our investigators to truly understand what their needs are at every step of the process and you know keep them posted uh, where we are what are some uh, hurdles that might have come across and understand your input too but because it's so sophisticated yeah we're we're restricted on training capabilities on that one okay great thanks mm -hmm. thanks Shelly. martin hi delicia hi uh, very uh, impressed by your presentation and Thank your you. capabilities uh, I have two questions. One, I saw that your um, one of your cores could make peptides. Can you make the peptides on the GMP condition so that they can go into patients? That is a very good question. I have Dr. Sayed Kaleem Ahmed, who is our associate director. Dr. Ahmed, do you want to step in on that one? Yeah, so far, uh, you know, we just established the medicinal chemistry lab here. So, but uh, eventually we are going to make it as a GMP lab for sure you know, we can make the peptides for, you know, GMP-based conditions. Sorry, so you cannot do it right now? Uh, right now, not, but uh, in future, we are planning to make the GMP lab as well. Okay. Uh, and second, um, if biotech companies outside of USC would like to interact with you, would that be possible? Can you function as a CRO? Yes, yes. We, have, we have agreements in place for all the three of our cores where we have biotech and pharmaceutical companies collaborating with us for their needs. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do like to say, based on your comments from the question that it's eye-opening, you know, one of the things that I discovered after coming to USC and interacting with Annie and other people is our core facilities are our best kept secrets. Uh, and we have to make a diligent effort to make them a valuable resource to everybody on campus uh, and, and make them aware of our capabilities. Something that we are planning as an office and along with my core staff is um, conducting core seminars and having regular open house sessions to sort of bring in the actual zoom in picture of what our capabilities are uh, as far as the technology and how does that relate to your research. So keep an eye open for emails for that and we look forward to seeing you there as well. Um, any other questions that I can help answer? Any other questions? Yeah, so if, yeah, if I could just quickly follow up on uh, that comment. Uh, in terms of accessibility, are, are you envisioning any kind of seed grants or any other types of modalities that can help uh, uh, with accessibility to the services? Uh, you know, right now, because our core facilities and the infrastructure are heavily supported from the School of Pharmacy um, and our dean, um, we have internal grant mechanisms that sort of leverage our core facility usage, but that could be something that we can consider and look down in the future um, as far as seed grants to use our core facilities uh, and then go from there. But on, on, on the contrary, I would like to say, as USC affiliates, um, you get a discounted price for using our core facilities. And that's one of the advantages for having core facility on campus is because this is supported by the university, by the school, that we wanna uh, make sure that um, the prices are appropriate for USC affiliates as well. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Delisha. Hi. Um, thanks again for the presentation. Um, we, we have found that, particularly when we launch a new core facility, but even for existing core facilities, that those core pilots are a really good way to bring new folks in who haven't used the core facilities. We also subsidize for uh, the cancer center members, but I think beyond that, you know, these things can still be costly. So I think if you want to drum up attention and a business um, and the business, this, this could be a, a, a very good strategy. It's been really successful for us in the cancer center. Sure, I will talk to the right people at the Cancer Center to get a better understanding of how that goes, and, and maybe that's something that we could consider implementing. Yeah, thank you. Um, and on your comment uh, earlier, Dr. Lerman, you know, yes, I will provide you with a link to our website along with the brochure too, that sort of gives you like a snapshot of our core capabilities and the contact information, yes. All right, if there are no other questions, um, please know we do have this um, seminar recorded as we do the other CCD seminars. Emily Chu will send that um, to all the attendees in a follow-on email. 
And you also have available um, past seminars to look at um, for future references. If you have any questions at all, obviously you have our contacts um, for Delicia from the School of Pharmacy, for the Brown Center for Cancer Develop Drug Development, feel free to email me. Um, we also have my colleagues here from the MESH team. Melissa Rogers um, is our primary contact there. So uh, we look forward to future seminars and seeing you again. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.